Welcome to On the Issues. I'm Phoenix City Councilwoman Felda Williams. With the summer break behind us and a new council station underway, I want to welcome back viewers to the show. Today we're going to be meeting two important new leaders at the city. We'll meet the new city attorney, Brad Holm, to hear about his experience and some of the legal challenges ahead for the city. But first, we're going to talk about economic development. There are some exciting projects underway in District 1 that mean good jobs for Phoenix residents. To tell us more, I'm here with the economic developer, Christine Mackey. Thank you for having me. We've had lots of opportunities lately to uh, work together, but give us a little bit about your background, because you haven't been here that long, but you've been a whirlwind. Thank you, thank you. Um, actually hit one year yesterday, if you can believe it. It's just gone so quickly. I have been in Arizona my whole life, uh, grew up here and have been in commercial real estate my entire career, but I spent 16 years as part of the economic development team in Chandler and was fortunate enough that Phoenix called me just over a year ago and asked me to join this team, which I should have done years ago. Oh, well, that's very nice of you to say, but I, I will tell you, you have really, really uh, revamped the entire department. Um, I think one of their big failings in the past is they never bragged about what their accomplishments were, and you have been very active in letting people know what you're doing, and, but more importantly, you have really been working hard to get some new companies in here. So tell us a little bit about what's going on in District 1. Absolutely. You know, I really do believe that you put people inside of a box and they're going to stay in that box and you tear the walls of the box down and they're going to do their own thing and really show you what they can do. So we've been having a lot of fun over the last year really repositioning the message about Phoenix. It is such a big, bold, exciting city. And you're right. It was the quietest big city I'd ever met. And so uh, really getting out and telling the Phoenix story. There is so much going on and so many exciting things happen that people just really didn't know was happening. So uh, over the last year, we've uh, rebranded Phoenix and come up with our new marketing campaign, which is Phoenix is hot. So we're, we're busy always telling everybody all of the reasons why Phoenix is the hottest market in the country. Um, worked this last year and created nearly 9,000 jobs in the community on um, projects that city council and our team was directly involved in the attraction of. So really excited about what that could hold for this coming year. Uh, District 1 is one of our hottest markets, particularly Deer Valley. So you know, you hear on the news all the time about the low vacancy rates in Chandler and in Tempe and in, in the east part of the valley, but actually Deer Valley has the lowest of all of the office vacancy rates in the entire region. So it is a market that's closely, uh, is easily accessible by both the 101 and I-17. Uh, a lot of big players out in that market and uh, particularly USAA. So earlier, uh, earlier this week, and I apologize, it was last week, we were at a groundbreaking on Norterra West, which is the newest building that USAA is building. And what's so exciting about that is it's actually, actually a speculative building. So USAA won't be going into it, it's their real estate division. Um, and you know from the conversations we were having with that broker that um, they've already had multiple offers on the building and uh, assume that it will be fully leased before it even completes. Um, but speaking of USAA, they added 900 new jobs this past year in about 380,000 square feet. So they've been a, a tremendous employer in this market and just continue to grow. So uh, we kind of plan with, with the t development team out there with Metro that they'll finish this building and then just move right on to the next building and keep marching down the I-17. And uh, you look at kind of the Lone Cactus business center area. You had the land redistribution. You've got biodynamics. You have Tremel Crow, who has uh, is just getting ready to complete 200,000 square feet of new industrial space. Um, you've got um, JB Precision. Bean Drywall is under construction with their new corporate headquarters. Um, you've got all of these great employers, Galco International, all of these great employers who are building new buildings in that Deer Valley market. And, um, and now uh, an event space is getting ready to open in the middle of the industrial park, which is Chateau Lux. And it is a, a really for those corporate events when you're attracting companies and they need to hold job fairs or hold those signature events. Those are those places, those businesses in Deer Valley can now use. You know, you've got your major employers up there, American Express and Honeywell and Discover and 
um, on Pet a health, Smart. PetSmart, Pet, a, yeah, Pet phenomenal, a phenomenal employer. In fact, a great portion of my paycheck ends up at PetSmart every uh, week. Mine too. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, you've got the merger between Albertsons and Safeway, and we were very fortunate. They selected to keep their corporate headquarters right in District 1, right along I-17. So the Deer Valley market is just truly one of the hottest, if not the hottest market in the region. Some other exciting things going on. We're seeing the redevelopment of Metro Center. Yes. Um, I, I, I remember being a kid and when Metro <laughs> Center first opened and my mom would bribe us to go back to school shopping by telling us we could go ice skating. Exactly. Everybody, either they remember ice skating or cruising at uh, Metro Center. Oh, absolutely. Ooh, I remember yeah, those days. Time. I just dated myself, I think. But yes, I remember those days. So you look at Metro Center, they are busy out there. The old Broadway is under demolition, mm -hmm. and that will be a super Walmart, which will bring new vibrancy to that area. Um, some of the real estate that surrounds the Metro Center area is up for sale, and um, they're getting multiple bids on the real estate. They know with I-17 and all the dynamic activity in that market that they won't be able to touch that real estate pretty soon. So um, really excited about where that'll go with the passage of Proposition 104, of course. Very we'll exciting. see light rail move into that market. So thank you for all of your hard work on that. That's gonna be a game changer for uh, Metro Center. But not only that, is that it provides all of the infrastructure, you know, the repaving and all of the new streets and really helping in that area get us back into new landscaping and sidewalks and, and getting that back in that area, which will be exciting. It's very exciting. I, I, I'm very appreciative. The neighbors and the businesses, especially around Metro Center, are extremely supportive and have um, of not only the construction, they were supportive of the 104, um, and they have really formed a, a business alliance mm -hmm. uh, to promote that area, and I think that makes a big difference. Um, word of mouth sells a lot, to whether it's to your neighbors or another corporation, and I think um, the owners of Metro Center were very pleasantly surprised to find the support, the community support, uh, for their efforts, because it's a huge investment that they've been sitting on for quite a while, um, well, hoping that all of this was going to happen, and it took much longer than expected, but it's, it's happening. It is happening, and that, that Metro Center property really is kind of ground zero. It's the corner of Maine and Maine where all the activity is happening. I think their, their patience is going to be uh, well rewarded for them with people who are interested in that market, and they are such a great group to work with. We're really fortunate to have such a great owner of that property moving forward. We really are. Well, what are our biggest challenges as the city? You know, it is a, it is a challenging time. Um, the nation still hasn't fully recovered from the recession, although we're well on a trajectory out of it, it hasn't recovered. I think there's still some trepidation in the market as to pulling the trigger really on those speculative buildings. And so I think with Norterra West breaking ground, that was a huge signal to the market that right. things are good. So as we fill that building quickly, we're going to see that, that fixed. But what we're really finding is a tightening of the employment market. So our unemployment rates are down significantly. And these major employers are out looking for that qualified workforce. That's what I'm hearing, that there's a real shortage. Um, so many that were building homes or in the construction field left uh, not only the valley, but left the industry. They found different jobs. And I know I encourage, um, it's wonderful. If you want to go to college, I think absolutely should. But there are a lot that college isn't the right fit but we really need skilled workers. We do need skilled workers, and the employers are pillaging from each other. Mm -hmm. And so bringing in that new workforce, uh, really bringing in new people to the market is, is really helping. But not only that, but we're partnering closely with our universities, uh, with Ottawa, and with Grand Canyon and ASU and our community colleges who are a tremendous workforce partner. And so what we've done is really link together to create that workforce and to train that workforce. And some of them are exactly right. They're not gonna be university bound. They're not college bound. So you can create a short four to six month certificate eligible program that gets them where they need to go, gets them on a trajectory to a, a career path. Exactly, and they can be very lucrative very lucrative. I'm telling my grandson about uh, 
what an electrician or a plumber can make. Oh my gosh, I know I definitely went into the wrong field. I should have gone into being an electrician or a plumber. Well, since I've had to call on those recently, <laughs> I now understand. Yeah, it's a very uh, well-paying job. It so, is, so it is. And exciting. you know, the great part about it is, is so much of what's happening, particularly in District 1, is on that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial level. So it is those, those people who are training themselves or who are doing on-the-job training or who just have that concept or idea and who are building facilities and going in and whether it's on the culinary side or the plumbing side or the you know, creative side, they're driving their own businesses right in, in that area. Oh, oh I'm, I'm very excited. I just, I'm, I'm a big believer. I think Phoenix is one of the best cities in the world. And I think it's because of the people and also because I think city employees are absolutely the best. And people like you who go out and sell Phoenix, um, your enthusiasm and the knowledge that you have, you're a terrific sales lady. <laughs> I just want you to know that. Uh, and you make things happen and you're, so many of the employees do, but I just want to tell you, you're doing great. And I know that uh, you, you talk about entrepreneurs and you've really been pushing that. How does somebody get involved in that? Uh, absolutely, so I get to work with an incredibly terrific team and part of the team focuses specifically on the entrepreneurial side. So if they log on to our website um, and click on the entrepreneurial pages, all of our, our team's direct contacts are right there. So we can get them involved either through our team or through our newsletter and make connections to them for the incubators if they're interested in on the tech side, on the software side, on the web side, if they're companies or service providers who are just interested in providing services to our entrepreneurs and to those early stage startup companies. They can log right onto our website, find our team's contact information, and we'll be happy to make those connections for them. Because particularly on the entrepreneurial side, you said it earlier, it's that word of mouth of how you get people connected. And particularly on the startup side, it's the word of mouth. And we know where the people are, we know where the people need help, and we know if someone's got an idea, someone has a creation, if they've got a concept, we can help connect them to the right people to see if it's something that can come to fruition. Is there a fee? There isn't, we're free today and today only. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I know you also uh, help corporations if they come in or expand uh, to help train employees. We do. We, uh, working with Economic Development is our workforce development team, uh, and they are the best in the business. I would stack our team up against anyone's, uh, and they're very creative. So they have grant funding where people that are companies that are hiring and need to find that qualified workforce, we can run their job fairs, we can do pre-screening, we can help that workforce with resume writing or that entry level training or just that little bit of polishing that they need and then help connect the people who are looking for a job, find the people that have those jobs. And so, you know, you often hear that, well, I, I couldn't find the people I was looking for. Well, my word to them was you're looking in the wrong place. They should look with our workforce team because they have access to thousands of individuals who are well-trained and well-skilled. And, and let's say a company comes in and they need a specific skill. Our group can actually work with our community college and create that specific skill. Uh, as, a, as an example, we have a company that has uh, uh, selected Phoenix that just hasn't announced yet, and they, are, um, they need med techs. And there aren't a deep, uh, there's not a depth of med techs in this region yet. And so we've created a, a med tech training program with Gateway Community College. And short training program, four months, we'll fund it. And uh, when they come out, they're qualified. And then this company will be hiring all of the people who graduate. So it's a win, win, win. You know, it's interesting you said that because uh, along the I-17, uh, mostly in District 1, we have like 16 different colleges. And many of those specialize in medical skills, whether it's LPN, RN, uh, different tech jobs, I mean, everything. Um, so I, I hope you keep those in mind, uh, especially if they're coming up there. Be, uh, I know we have uh, Brown Mackey has many students and they focus on the medical. I've toured theirs. It's really, really cool. They have, you know, they can they're not real cadavers, but uh, they look pretty realistic in those rooms. Uh, but it, it's very interesting. But um, 
I, I see us as a major distribution center for the whole Southwest. How do you feel about that? You are, are absolutely spot on on that and, and the reason that we are such an incredible distribution center for the Southwest is we're a five hour drive to virtually every market, eight at the most. We're certainly a day's drive to Texas or to the deep water ports in Long Beach or to the new ports that are coming up in Wymus into Salt Lake and Denver and New Mexico. So an easy five to eight hour drive for anybody who's distributing their product. So they can leave in the morning, they drop their product off and they're back in the evening. Uh, makes us an incredibly positive market for distribution. Also our transportation system is tremendous. You have I-17, you've got I-10, you've got our entire loop system and great rail access. So as you're looking at all of the distribution, uh, you really can come into the, the Phoenix market and not experience some of the regulatory and bureaucratic problems you face in some of the other states relating to distribution. So it's an easy market, particularly when you are along the I-17 and, and into the West Valley, you are literally five hours from dropping your cargo off in the deep water ports. It's amazing. Uh, people that who don't know this region, uh, I bet they're very surprised when they hear something like that. Incredibly surprised that they could be in, in and out in a day's drive back and forth and drop off either in Wymus or in Long Beach. That amazes them all the time when we, we've got maps that show the transportation um, hours to any particular market and that surprises them greatly. Well, I, I know we're also working on international air service. You know, it's one of my passions is getting more direct routes in here because I believe that's a way to get um, not only globally connected, but to get our products globally connected. And uh, I don't know if you work on that a lot, but I know that you have worked closely with the airport in supplying information. Uh, I know a recent trip uh, Deb Ostriker and I took, uh, it was amazing. The first words were, what new companies have come into your area? That will always be that question and the reason that is, so Deborah Ostreicher and you are known as the dynamic duo <laughs> out in the, in the International Air Service Recruitment Arena. And Deb, I've been working closely with Deb and really getting the message out to our companies because that is what those air service companies want to know is who's moved in and who's going to fill the front of our plane when we're flying a $150 million aircraft back and forth. So being able to make those connections with the companies and then not only that, but draw more companies in in, they're going to they're going to fly to Tokyo they're going to fly to London they're going to make those direct air service flights gives us greater opportunities and more for you and Deb to sell when you're out visiting with those air service and tell them what's coming um, it is a tremendous amenity for us to be able to have those direct air service and we have a number of them today that are filled and do incredibly well and um, working with Deb, really understanding where those next markets will probably most likely happen, actually give me insight into where to be focusing on recruiting new corporations for those that would bump us up over those levels to get that next direct air service in. So, and, and I'm so appreciative uh, because I guess I've been passionate about this for 20 years or plus uh, and have seen a lot of growth in this. But I, I think what's important is how much we can export out of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to international air service, it's very similar to the trucking. It's the, the cargo that they make the money on. It's not the passengers. And every plane that goes out of here has the cargo. And so we have a lot of opportunity, I think, uh, in that field, um, not only for international, but for regional service as well. So I think um, you are doing a fantastic job, and I just really, really appreciate what you do. You're always so much fun to talk to and be with uh, because it just bubbles out of you that you love what you're doing and you're doing a great job. It's kind of going back to where we started, the USAA. If, while I was sitting there talking to uh, the real estate people uh, from San Antonio, they said, you know, if we get this leased and we think we will have it leased before it's finished, we're gonna start immediately on the second building. Isn't that great news? I'm so excited. Oh my gosh, what a tremendous opportunity, not only for Phoenix, but for people. Those are good jobs. They are good jobs. Very good jobs. And um, that whole area is just blossoming. So I'm so proud to be able to represent that area and the people. Uh, we have great people who live there and work there. And 
we continue to focus on that area and I appreciate that you understand that and um, are able to, to do what you do in that area. So I just want to thank you for coming today and being part of it. Can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's an easy area to market. It really sells itself. Up next, we'll hear from Phoenix New City Attorney. Keep watching on the issues. What would you do if you saw a dog, a cat, or a horse that looked like this? Animal cruelty and neglect is a crime that needs to be reported. I'm Councilwoman Thelda Williams, here with my rescued pets, Henry and Cheyenne. And I'm Councilman Michael Novikowski, asking for your help. If you ever suspect animal cruelty, call Crime Stop, the Arizona Humane Society, or the Sheriff's Office. Animal cruelty is a crime. And together, we could stop it. Welcome back to On the Issues. The city's law department has a staff of 200 and provides legal advice to the city council and the entire city organization. We are here now with the man in charge of it all, city attorney Brad Holm. Brad, welcome to the show and welcome to the city of Phoenix. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Williams. So how long have you been on the job? Eight days. <laughs> We're talking new city attorney here. That's right. So tell us about your background. I grew up skiing in the mountains of Utah and as a young man and had an absolute blast doing that. Went to school there, undergraduate. I interrupted my college to go serve for two years in Frankfurt, Germany for my church as a volunteer. And while I was there, I developed my love of aviation. On my off days, I would go to the Frankfurt International Airport and watch the big planes come in. It was absolutely fascinating and fun and that led to some career choices down the road. When I returned um, from that effort, I uh, went back to my undergraduate program at BYU. I met my wife and married her. We have five children and now a handful of little grandchildren, so that's a lot of fun. They are fun. They are They're absolutely the a joy. You're right. And after um, completing my undergraduate, I uh, went to law school also at BYU, practiced law for a few years in Utah, and then came down here in 1986 moved to Phoenix and have practiced here since then. I practiced in a large law firm, one of the biggest uh, law firms in Phoenix and one of the most prestigious for about uh, 13 years as a partner, left the law firm, started my own firm, worked there for about 15 years, and then eight days ago joined the city of Phoenix. Well, we're delighted to have you. Thank you. I, I know you have um, worked for the city on some spatial assignments. Uh, or this, we've known each other for a long time. We have. And then most recently, lo and behold, I go to a Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport meeting and who's their new attorney? You. Yes, I had the great privilege of serving at Phoenix Mesa Gateway for about um, approximately 18 months as their general counsel. And as you know, having served on that board as you have, it's an exciting um, reliever type airport out in the East Valley. The, the airport surprisingly um, has a fairly significant economic impact in that area yeah, of the it valley. Um, it, it's uh, growing and developing. It has one airline now. The, the vision out there is to develop uh, more commercial opportunities out there. It's also a landlord of lots of aviation businesses on the airport. And finally, they also serve the military. Um, and in this important time of year, this summer time of year, they uh, refuel the tankers that fight fires in the Intermountain West. So I'll bet, I'll bet most people don't know that. They probably don't. Um, no. It's a very it's important a airport, both to the military and to the firefighting effort in the Western United States. Well, tell us about your department now that you've been on the job a whole eight days. <laughs> so we have, a, um, as you mentioned, almost uh, 200 employees. We have approximately 64, 65 in the civil side and the rest are on the criminal side. Um, but that doesn't mean we have that many lawyers. We have a um, much smaller number of lawyers, but we also have paralegals and legal assistants. Anybody who's ever worked in a law office knows that the most important people in a law office are the legal assistants because they make the lawyers look good. They get us to court on time. They prepare our briefs and our pleadings that are filed with court. And so they are critical and indispensable to the operation. That's on the civil side. On the criminal side, of course, I oversee the prosecutor's office. The prosecutor's office prosecutes violations of Phoenix ordinances, but also of state law. For example, simple assaults, 
retail theft, known as shoplifting, and um, other of those kinds of crimes, including DUI. So it's a very important office to keep our streets safe. It is, it, uh, and they have been uh, very creative. Uh, but I know we have talked about, uh, because of budget concerns, um, to increasing some of your staff rather than using outside lawyers. Um, do you have plans to continue that, or do you have ideas of how you want to redo things? Yes, so for a number of years, I represented the city of Phoenix on the outside as an outside lawyer. And I often wondered, although I benefited by that, it was a great professional opportunity, if some of the expertise could be developed in-house. I've only been in-house now for eight days, so I don't yet have a firm plan. But I have recognized that we have very, very good lawyers. On the civil side, I work with those lawyers the most closely and they have the capacity to develop some expertise in areas of the law that we currently now send to outside counsel. Of course, we'll always need um, outside lawyers for certain kinds of very narrow, unique expertise, like bond counsel, for example. But in the end, um, I think we have the capacity in terms of quality and talent of individuals to develop expertise in some of the areas that we now farm out to outside counsel. And I'd like to see that, I think it will improve the overall quality of our service, um, both to mayor and council and to city management. And it'll also have the effect of reducing some of the cost of legal services. And that's a significant cost to the city of Phoenix. It, it truly is. Uh, I've been very impressed with the staff that I've worked with because uh, they help us develop new ordinances and, and when we have some new ideas and or how to make improvements. And they've always been, we tell them the problem and they been very creative in coming up with workable solutions that the public can get behind and support uh, that aren't draconian, uh, but get the job done. So it, it's always great to work with them. Um, as far as the prosecutors, as you know, I'm big on animal abuse, so I want to encourage you to encourage them uh, not to be too kind uh, when they have those animal abuse cases. But I know uh, the prosecutor's office has been very creative too. Uh, working with the prostitutes, uh, some of the um, child abuse cases that come through us. We only do misdemeanors, correct? Correct. Uh, <laughs> felonies go across the street. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but how many cases do we have a year? Do you have any idea? I mean, it's... It's a significant number. We have um, over 100 jury trials a year. But of course, um, lots and lots of cases are not, don't go to a jury trial. They end up being resolved through some kind of a plea agreement. Sometimes the public criticizes plea agreements, but oftentimes plea agreements give us and the institution of the uh, prosecutor's office and the courts the opportunity to take a person who's made a mistake in his or her life and get them into a program and on a probationary track that will help them turn around their lives and improve their lives. And so we, we resolve many more cases that way, thousands of cases that way, and approximately um, between 100 and 200 that actually try every year. So, uh, and, and I'm sure people think, well, hmm, why does the city need a whole legal staff like that? On one hand, on the other hand, if you stop to think about, everybody likes to sue the city. They think deep pockets. I mean, some of the cases I have seen come through, um, although it can't be too specific because they're uh, done in E Station, but I mean, uh, come on. Uh, you broke your leg falling in a pothole in the middle of where? Uh, and we get sued and for millions. It's certainly true that there are um, lawsuits against the city that are lack of very much merit. I'll grant you that. Um, we also are involved in very important um, litigation on the city's behalf, some of which I know that you take a direct personal interest in, for example. In, um, I think it was at the end of 2013, you'll remember better than I, the mayor and council enacted an ordinance that prohibited the sale at pet stores of commercially um, produced and raised and bred uh, dogs and cats. And uh, that ordinance was obviously designed to have an effect on puppy mills. And it was a very um, far reaching, far sighted ordinance that had, in our view, a great uh, salutary effect. Well, immediately after the council passed it, it was challenged by a local business that did precisely that. They sold commercially bred dogs and cats. 
And obviously the ordinance's purpose in part was to um, also save rescue animals because it, in point of fact, um, directed that uh, all those kinds of pet stores could sell rescue dogs and cats and they could sell um, those kinds of animals just the way they'd done before, but they couldn't do the puppy mill sort of thing. So we got sued by a local business. Um, the local business filed that case in federal court and claimed it had a constitutional right to sell commercially bred um, dogs and cats. And um, in the course of the early proceedings in that case, the Humane Society intervened on our behalf and supported our ordinance. Um, a very bright federal judge, Harvard educated, took a hard look at it, demanded that the parties prepare the case very strenuously and to the nth degree, and we did. And we ultimately asked then the court to rule in our favor without the need for a trial, and the judge did. That happens in very few cases, so the judge is pretty confident, as we were confident, that um, the case should be, in fact, um, that the case should go, uh, that the ordinance should be upheld, I should say. And in point of fact, it was upheld. The case is now on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, but we feel relatively confident the Ninth Circuit will uphold it. Yeah. You did. You weren't there, but I know you would have taken a leadership role in that too. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you um, for taking the position and for being on the show today. Um, I know you're going to provide great leadership to the city and do a terrific job. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman Williams. That's all the time we have for this month's On the Issues. If you have any questions or comments about this show, call my office at 602-262-7444 or visit my website at phoenix.gov slash district one. We'll see you next time on the issues.